Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with the Opera Basic List as it stood in 1953, courtesy of Howard Taubman, music critic for the New York Times. Now, this is a particularly interesting list, and the reason is because it was 1953 was the dawn of the LP era, and so the operatic possibilities change dramatically in terms of home listening, and that's addressed in here. And I want to read you some of the preface to the chapter on opera here before we get to the A-list. There's an A-list and a B-list. And they're, it's very interesting here because he talks about, you know, what's available and what isn't available a little bit, and uh, oh my. So let's just talk about the technology. This is just great for a little bit of um, um, a little historical flavor in the Building a Record Library universe. Taubman writes, Before the arrival of the long-playing record, there were some complete operas on discs, but they were relatively scarce and so bulky in size that they were a problem to handle and to store. Boy, were they. Imagine two and a half, three hours worth of music on, on 78s, which had only three to four minutes per side. They were like, ah, you know, you needed, you needed a truck to carry them around. Now the standard repertoire, as well as a great deal that appears in the opera house, only in rare revivals, is nearly all on records. In fact, there are competing versions of most of the perennial favorites. As for size and weight, a full opera on long play is now more manageable than a scene or two used to be on shellac. Yeah. It may be that the popular scene or aria sung by an admired singer of past or present is all you want of any opera. In that case, you should not bother with the complete work. You will find some recommendations of operatic aria collections in the chapter on vocal music. But it should be borne in mind that the great operas are rounded works of art and that you can best relish their scope and variety when you have them whole. Though opera is designed for the theater and is meant to be seen as well as heard, it has special delights to offer on discs. Poor staging and acting, which, alas, mar some productions in the opera house, nothing has changed there, has it? Cannot obtrude on your concentration, and it is possible when you listen to an opera in the privacy of your home to discover and enjoy hitherto unnoticed subtleties in the music. Some operas, indeed, may be better on records than in a large theater. Verdi's Falstaff is a good example. It is so tightly put together, and it moves so lightly and so swiftly, that some of its most wonderful inspirations are gone before you have had time to savor them on the stage. I have heard seasoned opera goers pronounce the piece as dull. Take my word for it. Falstaff is a great masterpiece that will yield fresh pleasure with each hearing, but you must give it and yourself time. So there you go. It's really, really cool. I mean, some things have changed, some things haven't. But let's look at the A-list, shall we? Because it's fascinating to see what's on here and what was available. You will note that in the A-list, they do not discuss conductors and singers. Only operas and the record label that it's on, leaving us to guess which one it might have been. Some of you doubtless will know. Um, I know some of them, but, <laughs> you know, there wasn't so much choice that it mattered. If you wanted the work, this is what you had to get, basically. He talks about multiple recordings of things, but multiple recordings means two or three, not 40 or 50, as we have now. So, uh, you know, it's a very, very different circumstance. So opera, the basic list, the A list. Beethoven, Fidelio on Vox, three discs. Bellini, Norma on Chetra, three discs. Notice the major labels are just like, uh, nowhere. Bizet, Carbon on Victor, three discs. That was probably the Reiner with Reza Stevens. Remember that one? Something like that. Um, Donizetti, Don Pasquale, Westminster, three discs. Le Liseur d'Amore, Cetra, three discs. Lucia de Lammermoor, Cetra, three discs. I mean, fascinating, isn't it? We're, we're, we're way before the modern era of complete opera recordings. Just let's get that straight. Gershwin, Porgy and Bess, Columbia, three discs. That's the abridged version. Gluck, Alceste, no recommendation. There wasn't one. He just tells you that it exists. 
and maybe you could look for it. Orfeo ed Oiridice, Vox abridged one disc. That was all you could do with Gluck. Guno, Faust, Victor, three discs. Faust has really fallen by the wayside, hasn't it? I mean, it was such a standard opera. It was the big French opera after Carmen. But, um, you know, now not so much. There's a lot more French opera, actually, besides that, that's more popular or more performed. Humperdinck, Hansel and Gretel, Urania, two discs. Leon Cavallo, Pagliacci, Victor, two discs. Victor, by the way, is RCA. So you could figure out, you know, you had the, the Toscaninis and you had the RCA artists like Bjorling and Zinka Milinoff and those people. And they were basically working with the RCA, you know, Italiana Opera Orchestra, the Rome Orchestra, under conductors like Jonel Purley and, and people like that. Or it was a Toscanini thing, or it was, you know, basically that's what that's what you had on Victor. Uh, Mascagni, Cavalleria Rusticana, Columbia, two discs. Massenet, Manon, London, three discs. However, they have, a, they have a thing about Manon. Wait a minute. This is really a cute little comment. About Manon, he writes, Beware of the one available recording of Manon by Massenet. It is all right musically, but there is a commentator discussing the action in French, which may be annoying to you. <laughs> yeah. That would be annoying to me. Um, Mozart, Cosi Fantuti, Victor, three discs, Don Giovanni, Victor, three discs, The Abduction from the Seraglio, London, three discs, The Nozze de Figaro, Victor, two discs, heavily cut, absolutely. Die Zauberflöte, Victor, three discs. Mozart, of course, is their exemplar for opera, naturally. Um, let's see, we've got, let's see, Mussorgsky, Boris Gudnoff, HMV, four discs. Puccini, La Boheme, Victor, two discs. Madame Butterfly, Victor, two discs. Also abridged somewhat. Uh, Tosca, Victor, two discs. And Turandot, Chetra, four discs? Four discs for Turandot? Mm. Rossini, The Barber of Seville, Victor, three discs. La Cenarentola, Chetra, abridged, two discs. Now notice, they say abridged when it's like super duper abridged. They don't bother to say that it's abridged when it's a live performance or if it has normal stage cuts, such as what happened in the opera house. That doesn't count as abridged, even though by our standards today of doing complete everything, that would be pretty heavily chopped up. Um, Strauss, Der Rosenkavalier, Victor, abridged two discs, and that's all there is of Strauss. Nothing else which I find, I find astonishing. It could be that Salome isn't there for moral reasons. And Electra, but who knows? Yeah, was there a performance available? Who knows? Verdi. Okay, Aida, London, three discs. Don Carlo, Chetra, four discs. Falstaff, Chetra, three discs. Otello, Urania, three discs. Rigoletto, Victor, three discs. La Traviata, Victor, three discs. And you know, two discs, pardon me, also cut. And Il Trovatore, Victor, three discs. So that's Verdi. We get a lot of Verdi. Wagner, Lohengrin, Urania, five discs. Die Meistersinger, Columbia, five discs. Parsifal, that's got to be the 51, um, uh, what's his name, Knappertsbusch one that was on that was on London, six discs worth of it. And then The Ring, and then they tell you no complete LP of any Ring opera at this point. They should just tell you what they are, but there was nothing to buy. Tristan and Isolde, Victor, four discs. And that is the entire A-list. Note what's missing. It's really astonishing compared to what we have. First of all, there's nobody like like Janacek, who's very popular now. His operas have been recorded fairly frequently. Nothing like that. There is no um, Baroque opera. None. Very, very little. They do mention Handel, Asus, and Galatea, and Julius Caesar in English as an opera. But, you know, I mean, remember the first recordings of those things were cut to ribbons and there were no castrati, so the parts are all rearranged and whatnot. The so Baroque opera, which is the big deal today, really, it doesn't exist. In 1953, you know, they do mention Orfeo, um, and they do mention Monteverdi's Orfeo, actually, but it's not in their A-list. Of course not. And then we have, you know, operas from all over the world that we can enjoy on recordings today. I mean, there's the whole world of Finnish opera, 
with the Finnish National Opera that we, we, we don't hear. There are all the other Russian operas besides Mussorgsky. There's no Tchaikovsky, no Rimsky-Korsakov, none. Zippo, certainly not Shostakovich or Prokofiev. Uh, this is a uh, very 1953 list. Let's put it that way. Now, the core, the core, of course, of the operatic repertoire hasn't changed much at all because, of course, the issue with opera is, is money. It's money. It's, it's money more than anything else. Operas are big, huge, complex, expensive things. So you would think that the repertoire itself would, would change rather more slowly than the repertoire for orchestral music. But in a way, it's not true because the operatic repertoire, as you can see from the A-list, is far more limited. Um, than the other repertories. Um, there are many fewer works that are part of the, the standard run. And because there are so many fewer works, changes are relatively easier to spot. For example, Janicek operas, Benjamin Britten operas, of which there isn't a single mention of anything here, or in any English operas for that matter. They say, he says here, actually, you may, it may, you may find this an interesting remark, which will set some people's Teeth on edge. Hang on a secy. Let me get to it. There we go. Uh, let's see. French opera goes back to the time of Louis the Fourteenth. Reached its flower in the nineteenth century. <laughs> Skip everything between Louis the Fourteenth and the nineteenth century because you know what difference does it make? And let's see what else we got here. Uh, but ta -ta, ta -ta. in our own century, let's see. No, that's it. it. Oh my goodness. Oh, here we go. England's best native opera, Dido and Aeneas goes back to the 17th century. And if you add Handel, who lived a large part of his creative life in London, his Aces and Galatea and Julius Caesar extend English opera. Julius Caesar is an English opera. Mm. In 1953, it was, I guess, to the first half of the 18th century, and there's nothing after that. Absolutely nothing. Zero, zilch, nothing. That's the joy of going back to 1953 and having a look at what the basic list was, and even more interestingly, what their view of the repertoire was in that day and age. So keep on listening, friends. I hope you get a kick out of this series. I'm having fun going through these things. The operatic B list is next. Take care.